glad we got a Bible in our hand we can put our utmost confidence in is the very Word of God itself. And thank the Lord for it. All right, get chapter number 34. <clears throat> we started out in chapter number 33. Chapter 33, the, uh, Moses said, uh, Lord, if, if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go, Lord. <laughs> hey, hey, I thank God that he'll go with us. Amen. I praise the Lord for that this morning. But in chapter number 33, uh, when the Lord said, I'll be with you, I'll go with you, Moses asked to do something. He said, Lord, he said, show me thy glory. I want to see the glory of God. That's an interesting thought as we get to chapter number 34. What is the glory of God? You know, if you've got a lot of people today talk about the Shekinah glory of God. That's the glow of God. Matter of fact, that's, they use that word. It's not found in the Bible, but that's actually what Moses saw. The Lord said, there's a place by me. He stood him on a rock hit him in the cliff of that rock, put his hand over it, and passed by. And after God passed by, he let Moses see the hinder parts of his glory. we got a lot of people today talk about seeing the Shekinah glory of God. They don't see the Shekinah glory of God in our day. That, that would be extra biblical revelation. We have no revelation outside of what you've got in your hand. That's the importance of your Bible. This is everything that God has told us about life, liberty, salvation, truth, doctrine, everything is found in your Bible. Not outside the Bible. If, it, if, if you got revelation outside of your Bible, then God's not through writing the book. We have the Word of God in our hands, so these partial gifts have passed. But when he said, show me thy glory, I want you to look in verse number 5 again of chapter 34. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him. Now, he did not see God's person. God descended in a cloud. He said, no man can see my face and live. Uh, people talk about seeing uh, the Lord Jesus and seeing God and all this type of stuff. The Bible says you can't. Look upon the glory of God in your humanity. You can't do that. It'd take a glorified body to do that. And one day we'll see him as he is, and then that day we'll be like him. But at the same time, he passed by and he hid him. And with that, But when he passed by, he showed him the glory of God. It was through proclamation. I want you to understand, I'm not talking about the afterglow of God when he went by. That's not what he's talking about here. He said he proclaimed in verse number 6, the Lord, the Lord God. I dealt with that last week. You see a double mention of the Lord and the Lord God. The Lord, that word Lord means Jehovah. That's an Old Testament name for Almighty Jehovah God. He did the same thing with Moses over at the burning bush. He doubled what he said, I am that I am. He used that twice. What is I am? It just means he's an ever-present, all-existing God. He has no past. He has no future. He lives in an I am in an eternal state. That's why when we get to heaven, we're not going to have any past. We're not going to have any future. That's, hey, when we get there, it's going to be one eternal moment. That's why God can get so much stuff done. He's not tied to a watch. He doesn't have a clock up there that he works by. He works in eternity. So he's on both sides of us at the same time. But notice what he said. He said he proclaimed the Lord. That means a self-existing one. Means the eternal one. Then he said the Lord God. That goes right back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. So what he's doing, he's just tying himself to the Trinity. Almighty God, Elohim, as that word is used in your uh, Hebrew in chapter number one of the book of Genesis, in the beginning God, that word is Elohim. That's a plural word. That's why the Bible said that God said, let us. Let us. You find the plurality of God. A lot of people say you can't find the Trinity in the Bible. You can find Trinity all over the Bible. One of the best New Testament verses is the one the New Bibles leave out. 
or they explain it away. If you've got a Schofield Bible, see, I Schofield made it go away, even though he put it in there. He said this is uh, not in the most ancient manuscripts and is generally agreed it has no authority. That's 1 John 5, 7, where the Bible said that there are three in heaven. God the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's one of the best uh, mentions of the Trinity in your Bible. So when he said the Lord, the Lord God... He's talking about who he is in his person. He's not talking about God the Father, God the Spirit. He's talking about Jehovah God. Jehovah God became Jesus Christ. That was Jehovah God of the Old Testament that was born in that womb. Now, notice what he said. The Lord said, this, this is his glory. He said, one, he's merciful and gracious. Now, his glory is not found in his mercy and grace. I thank God for that. It's found in that He is merciful and gracious. That talks about the person of God, not an act of God. Why is God merciful to people today? Because He's a merciful God. You know, He doesn't have to show mercy. God doesn't. What's the difference between grace and mercy again? Mercy means you don't get what you deserve. You know, we, boy, we get somebody down and make them holler, Uncle or Mercy. Huh? You ever done that? Hey, hey, we did that. Hey, we, we got you down. You deserve to be beat up on. But if you holler mercy, we'll, we'll be a little merciful. Didn't have to be merciful to him. God does not have to give mercy. He gives mercy because he's merciful. The word mercy means you do not get what you deserve. The word gracious, that word grace means that you get what you do not deserve. All right? We deserve hell. That's mercy. We don't deserve heaven, that's grace. So you find the two uses that work. But in the glory of God, we find that's found not in His action. It's found in His person. He's proclaiming the Lord, the Lord God, that He's one, a merciful God, and one, He's a very gracious God. Listen, God's good to us. Sometimes people think God's just some kind of ogre up in heaven waiting with a two before to knock you in the head every time you do something wrong. Listen, God's, God's good. The Bible said it rains on the just and the unjust. When I get rain at my house, my neighbor who never goes to church, he gets rain too. Sometimes I think he gets more than I do. You know, it's I, I, they're just a, we live in a dry spot out there where we are. I, we watch the clouds coming. You know, I've got these, and I left my cell phone at home. Isn't that a blessing this morning? I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Amen. I left that, and not intentionally got halfway down the road. Barbara said, you got time to go back and get it? And I said, nope. <laughs> Going on down, you know, I used to come to church without a cell phone. I think we can operate without that thing for a little bit. But we're talking about the person of God. What, where is the glory found? Not in his actions. His actions are a result of who and what he is. God's merciful and God's gracious. So we find the glory of God's found in his person. Notice what he said, long-suffering. Not just that he suffers long, but that he is long-suffering. He... And I'm going to deal with that this morning when I preach. Lord puts up with a whole whole lot of mess out here, folks. Why didn't he just destroy this whole thing, wipe all of them, take us to heaven and wipe this thing clean, get this garbage out of here? You know, I don't even turn news on most of the time. I try to turn on the first two minutes. And if they can't tell me something new in two minutes, I turn it off because then all you get is opinion nowadays. You don't get news. They bring in they bring in the panel and they discuss and talk back and forth. Just a bunch of talking heads. That's all they are. They're not doing anything. They're talking heads. If they... If they if they have the answers, let them run for office and straighten the thing out. But what we have today is we have the long-suffering of God. In the, in the days of Noah, the Bible said that God was long-suffering when the ark was a preparing. It took Noah 120 years to build that ark. I call it Noah's folly. You know what they called a freight train the first time they made a, a steam engine? Fulton's Folly. That's what they called it. It was folly that somebody could make a steam engine that could actually 
power and move things and work things. They called that thing Fulton's Folly. Here he is, it's never rained. It didn't rain until the flood. A water, a mist went up from the ground and watered everything just like it did in the Garden of Eden. They didn't have rain. Never had a rain cloud. Cloudless skies. Here's this guy for 120 years building an ark of that magnitude. He's building a boat with nothing to float. There's nothing there. Can you imagine the ridicule that he took? Every day he'd come by, how's it going, Noah? You know, he was over just a hammering away and a sawing away and getting the work done. 120 years is what the Bible said that he labored on that until that ark was done. And then when that ark was finished, God opened the door and said, come in, and no one in his family went in. And the long-suffering of God, God kept the door of that ark open for seven days. While no one in his family was in there, the animals were all, everything was packed up and ready to go. I'm sure Noah stood in the door of that ark and said, you better get on board, honey. But one day God shut the door. And when God shuts the door, no man opens that door. Noah didn't shut the door to that ark. God shut him in. And when he did, then the rains began to descend and the bowels of the earth broke open. And but Can you imagine them lined up out beating on the hull of that ship too late? Listen, God's long-suffering. That's what he, well, part of the glory of God is. He puts up with a whole lot, all right? Now I said I'm going to deal with that later. And then abundant in goodness and truth. He ties two things together. The truth with goodness. You know, people act like the Bible's their enemy. They're scared to death to pick this up. They, uh, they'll leave it sitting around the house. They don't ever pick it up and read it. You say, why? They're afraid of what it says. You ought to read your Bible every day. You ought to read it through. You ought to just start in Genesis chapter 1 and, and Matthew chapter number 1 and read that Bible through. Most people that are saved or, pro or proclaimed to be saved have never read that Bible from cover to cover. It takes you 72 hours of reading. That's just three days out of a year. 72 hours, of, hey, you spread 72 hours over 10 years. They haven't read the Bible through from cover to cover in their lifetime. God ties His goodness up with the Word of God. This is a good Bible, all right? This is my lifeline. This, this is what keeps me operating with God, staying with God. Staying in the Bible is what keeps me on point. Keeps us from getting off on tangents and getting out of the will of God. Most, most people that uh, all this charismatic and all that stuff today, listen, they have no idea what the Bible says. Roman Catholics, they have no idea what the Bible says. They're not taught to read and study the Bible. I'm not demeaning those people. I'm talking about ignorance. Now, you get back down into the Baptist camps, you'd be surprised how many Baptists can't tell you where to find something in the Bible. But they've been saved 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 20 years. That tells me they're not reading their Bible, all right? They're not studying their Bible. Now, he tied goodness Together, anytime you find and in the English language, let me give you just an easy little link, uh, English lesson. And ties together two equal structures. It's David and Barbara. That ties us together, but it ties us together in equality. It takes two of us to make the marriage. It takes two to tango, all right? It, ta it takes two to make a marriage work. That's, that's what makes that thing work. It's on both ends. Now, he ties goodness with the Word of God. He's abundant in goodness. Why? Because he's an abundant in truth. The Bible said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Most people say set you free. Truth doesn't set you free. It makes you free. Now, you say, what's the difference? I can go down to jail and they give me the keys to all of the, all the cells and I could open up every cell down there at the Lawrence County Detention Center down there, open it all up, say, I'm going to set you free. Now, at that point in time, they've got an option. They can walk out or stay in. You know, some people like to be incarcerated. There's some people, and I'm not just talking about mean people, 
people, or people that have spent years and years in that system cannot operate outside of the system. There was one old man one time walked into a bank. He had been in prison for 30 plus years. Getting old, he walked in that bank. He couldn't live outside. He handed the little girl a note. This is a robbery. Let her push the button and let them put him right back into prison again. You know, there are people in the military that way. There's a difference between a career soldier and what we call lifers. If any of you have ever been in the military, some people are lifers. You know, when I went in the military, they said, I'm your mama, I'm your daddy, I'm your brother, I'm your sister, I'm your boyfriend, I'm your girlfriend, and I am the worst enemy you've got. And that's, that's what the Army is. What they do, if you spend all your money, we used to get paid in cash on the first day of the month. We'd walk up to the payroll officer and salute him, and they'd put that money out in cash. you put it in your pocket, and you'd go over to the service club. It was casino night. And I've seen them walk out of there the first day without a penny to last them 30 or 31 days. They didn't have a dime in their pocket, but they had a place to sleep. They had a mess hall to eat in. They had everything provided, mom and daddy, all right? God is gracious in his truth. He provides for you and I through the word of God. So the glory of God is in his person. Look at verse number uh, 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Aren't you glad he does that? But let me tell you, he doesn't do it for everybody. You say, why? Because there's no repentance. One of the things that's been left out of salvation is the word repentance. People don't now, they say, oh, all you've got to do is believe. I understand that. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have turned from the world over here. You've turned to Him. And hey, it's an admission of guilt and it's a sorrow for guilt. That's what I didn't repent of uh, having pack cigarettes in my pocket or my drinking or anything else. I didn't, I didn't even think about that night I got saved. I just knew who and what I was, and I was sick and tired of it. I was sorry, and it made an immediate change in my life. When I walked out of that church, I poured the booze out. I went in there. God broke my cusser. I came home. My wife got a brand-new husband. Listen, all things became new at that moment. He doesn't give everybody mercy, and even among God's children. You know, sometimes you do something and do it and do it and do it and get away with it, and somebody else gets, first time they get caught, God nails them. You ever notice that? You say, well, Lord, how, how come they didn't get away with what I did? Or here's the more common thing, Lord, why didn't you do to them what you did to me? Because God knows the end from the beginning. God knows you're going to get that right down the road or if you're just going to continue in the grace of God, using it for lasciviousness and moving down the road. God knows what you're going to do and God operates differently. But notice what he said, keeping, not giving, keeping mercy for thousands, for giving uh, iniquity and transgression is sin. He's keeping that and he gives to some, he doesn't to all. Notice what he said. He said, and that will by no means Clear the guilty. He's talking about those that are continuing in that. God, listen, don't play games with God. Don't mess with God. A lot of people, they, they act like God's dumb and doesn't know what's going on. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees in the darkness just like he does in the light. God's already numbered the hairs on your head. That don't mean I've got seven. It means this one's number three. Okay, he's numbered these things. He knows when a sparrow drops to the ground, God sees everything. The Bible said the eye of the Lord runs to and fro on the earth, seeing and or beholding both the good and the evil. God sees. Now notice what he said, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children. Sometimes the sins of the fathers go to the children and to the children's children, the grandchildren. Drunkenness. You know when people got drunkenness in their family, it usually keeps going down the ladder. Children are drunkards. They hated to see their daddy drunk, falling down, mean to them. But then they pick up the bottle like he did. And the grandchildren, they hate to see grandpop and pop doing it. And the grandchildren pick the same thing up down the road. All right, now what he's talking about 
and you say they, he can't deliver. I'll show you in a minute where he does. But notice what he said upon the children until the third and to the fourth generation. God will visit the iniquity upon the fathers. Now, hold your hand there. Turn back to Exodus 20. You say, well, boy, our kids have no hope. They got the same hope you've got. Aren't you good, glad God is gracious? Chapter number 20, we have the moral law. The Ten Commandments are given in chapter number 20. Now, if you look in verse number 5, Thou shalt, shalt not bow down thyself to them. He's talking about likenesses, idolatry. You got a lot of that. Let me, and I don't just pick on Roman Catholic Church. It's just full of idols. They got them up there. They bow down to them. They pray to them. And that, first commandment, God said, you don't do that. Now, notice what he said. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Here's what he said up there. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. It, isn't that what he said back here? <clears throat> now, I want you to look at the last part of the verse. Of them that hate me. You say, well, the children are doomed. No, they're not either. They're doomed when they hate God just like the Father hated God. That's when they're doomed, son. Hey, they can break that curse. I've seen some of the best Christian people I have ever met in my life come out of a drunkard's home. I'm talking about good Christian. I'm talking about love God, get saved, love God, serve God, go into the ministry. God calls them. God uses them. Hey, this is not a curse on the children in general. It is a curse in the children that walk in the steps of that father. That's the ones that get in trouble. Listen, you can walk different. You are in control of your spiritual life. You can't blame somebody else for where you are this morning. Don't even, don't even go there. These are personal choices, and choices have consequences, either good or bad. When we make a choice, every choice we make has a consequence, either good if we do right or bad if we don't. But the consequences on us. Uh, one thing people do today is they always blame somebody else. And by the way, as long as you can remain a victim, you'll never get right. Well... Look, I know I'm bad, but look at this one over here or look what they did to me or whatever. Listen, your action and reaction to whatever happens is up to you. You can come out better. You can come out bitter. You can come out any way you want to. It's a personal choice. So what he's saying was he's keeping mercy. Why? Because he's merciful. God wants to give mercy. He's keeping grace. Why? Because God's gracious. He's keeping long suffering. Why? Because he suffers long. He's abundant in goodness. God wants to be good to us. God wants to be good to your neighbor. God wants to be good to everybody. God loves people. For God so loved the world. That's not a select few or an elect few as the Calvinists come up with. The world means the world. The Bible said, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. What does all mean? All means all, and that's all all means. He died for the world, all right? Now, he's keeping it up for them. Verse 8, and Moses did something. He wanted to see the glory of God, but God proclaimed the glory of God in his person. Not in what he looked like, not in the Shekinah glory of God, but in how God acts and reacts with people. Now, when he saw that, he made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. When you see God as he is, now it's hard for us to do sometimes. Uh, you know, the Bible said over in 1 John, what, chapter number uh, 3 and verse number. Three, I think it is, verse number two. And uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right, he's talking about children of God. One day we'll be like him, but we're not like him now. But we need to see him how, through the eyes of what God is telling us. How do you know God's good? God says he's good. Then you see how God is good to you. God's merciful to you. He's gracious to you. 
Uh, God is abundant in His goodness. God's abundant in His truth. That truth makes you free. And when Moses saw this, listen, he, see, he was wanting to see a presence of God. But God's presence is in what He does because of who He is. That's where the glory is. He made haste, but He fell on His face and He worshiped. Notice verse 9, and He said, If now I have found grace in Thy sight, O Lord... You said, you gracious, Lord, have I found grace in your sight. You know, the first time the word grace is used, it's over in Genesis chapter number 6, where the Bible said, and Noah found grace. Where did he find it? In the eyes of the Lord. He found his grace in the eyes of the Lord. Moses is going to find his grace the same way. It's when he is obedient to God, when he does what God tells him, then he finds the grace of God. What is Grace is, like I said, you get what you don't deserve. God's better to us than we deserve this morning. That's what he's talking about. And Moses fell on his face. He said, now, if I found grace in thy sight, let my Lord, I pray thee, go where? You see that in verse number nine? Go where? Go among us. Why? Because he said, I'm going to send an angel before you, but I'm going to be camping outside of the congregation. He said, Lord, you've got to go among us. Listen, we don't just need Lord with us, all right? We need him for us. That's why over in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse number 5, he said, Nevertheless, the last part of that verse, Nevertheless, I will never leave thee. That means he'll be there with you. Nor forsake thee. That means he'll be there on your side. He'll be there for you. He said, and that's, that's all Moses was asking. He said, just go among us, Lord. Why? Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. All right, listen, if God be for you, who can be against you? That's all he's saying. Go to the New Testament. He said, for it's a stiff-necked people. Boy, he knew this crowd. Listen, they haven't got right with God yet. Moses came down off of that mountain. God said the people have corrupted themselves. Hey, God chastised them. Moses broke the tablets at the bottom of the mountain, uh, burned them in the fire, strawed it in the water, and made them drink it. Hey, listen, they punished them. But they weren't right with God. They were like that little girl again. I'm sitting down, but I'm standing up in my heart. Hmm? He said, these people haven't got right with God. They're stiff-necked people. Listen, they just brought them uh, a few months ago out of Egypt. God brought them out with a high hand. They saw the power of God in those plagues that God brought down. He brought them out, spoiled the Egyptians. I mean, the Egyptians let them borrow all their gold and silver and precious stones, loaded them down, and they came out and came to the Red Sea. They griped, they complained. They said, hey, you brought us out here to kill us. God told old Moses, you tell them to go forward. Hey, there's, a, there's, there's something called a sea in front of them out here. <laughs> He said, you go forward, and God sat there and opened up that path wide enough for three and a half million people plus all their flocks. Listen, that wasn't a little path through that Red Sea. It would have took them six months to get them people through there. They traveled through there overnight. That morning, they went in through there. They just walked right on through that thing on the other side, watched him drown the Egyptians. He made the water sweet at Mara. Boy, you go all the way through. God's given them. Hey, he's given them. Uh, water out of a rock. You know, you got a rock that follows them called Christ, and it keeps giving them water. They get manna from heaven. God's feeding them, taking care of them. And Moses goes 40 days up on the mountain, and they build idols. Said, these be the gods. Listen, they're stiff-necked in their heart. Moses knew that. Now notice what he said in verse 9. And pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. He said, take us for thine inheritance. Why? God already told Moses, I can kill that whole crowd and make another nation out of you. He said, make us Israel. Listen, Israel is not in the will of God today, but they're God's people. Don't you ever forget the nation, hey, you curse Israel, but if God said, I'll curse you, he said, I'll bless them that bless thee every day. I get up and bless Israel. Uh -huh. 
not just to get a blessing. I bless them because I love the nation of Israel. I'm looking forward one day when they see him as he is. And friend, then that day they'll walk in the light of the glory of God on this earth for an eternity. God's earthly people. Boy, what a blessing. He said, take us to thine inheritance. And he said, now this is God. Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. Now, what he's going to make here is what's called an unconditional covenant. Again, you have conditional covenants. That is if. If you do this, I'll do that. That's based on condition. When God makes a unconditional covenant, He just said, I will. I'm going to do something, all right? So He said here, He said, I make a covenant before all thy people. I'll do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth. Wait a minute. Look at the marvels God's already done in earth. I'm talking about from Noah's day all the way forward. Has God not done some tremendous things? Wow. He said, I'm going to do something now in front of you that is greater than everything that I have ever done on the other side. You've already seen this, but I'm going to show you marvels even greater than these things. You know, sometimes we think in the last days God doesn't do a lot, and I'm just going to have to shut it off, and we're going to come back to verse 10. But you know, the Bible talked about this latter house. You remember when they went back and built Zerubbabel's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed. When they went into the Babylonian captivity about 587 B.C., they destroyed that temple. They burnt the the gates, they tore the walls down, they took all the paraphernalia out of the temples and everything else. When they came back under Ezra, Nehemiah built the walls, Ezra came back to build the temple itself. When they laid the foundation, the Bible said that the young men shouted and the old men wept. And one of them said, it's not like it used to be. Listen, there was no temple ever built that had the glory of Solomon's. Solomon's temple was something you couldn't even build that thing today. You don't have enough money to build that thing today. I'm talking about the glory of that thing. But he said that in these latter days, he said, I'm going to be more glorious to you than I was in the days of Solomon. You know, today we look in these big edifices and these big churches and uh, we kind of go by the little country church. Don't you like the little country churches? Uh, you just go by the little country. People just blow by. Why? Oh, man, they, they want to be in the first and the second. You know, I don't know why anybody would want to be in the second Baptist church. I'm not complaining. I mean, somebody asked a man one time, what's second place? He said, that's first loser. I think I'd change the name of that. I'm not knocking them down there, but I don't believe I'd be second or third or fourth Baptist. I think I'd have to come up with another name than that one. But at the same time, they're, they're not looking for where God is. I'm not saying God can't be in these churches, but they're not looking for where God is. Where's God? God's where the Bible's preached. That's where God is. God's presence is here. So what happens is, and I'm not complaining about that, but everybody wants to go down there. You know, a lot of people join these first churches because it's good for their professional life. They're, you know, it's where, and I'm not complaining to you doctors and your big name lawyers and everything go down there. Why? Because they get, their, they get their name out. They become somebody down here. Here they just become brother or sister. And not Dr. Whoever, I'd call him Dr. Slackjaw or something. You know, it, it, hey, it doesn't matter what's behind your name or in front of your name. When you come into the house of God, we're all, including the pulpit, on an equal plane. No big I's, no little U's, no big money, no little money. Hey, God makes a difference through this. This is the difference between most churches, all right? A lot of churches, they preach the Bible straight. Thank God. Listen, you're not the only church that ever uh, said under King James Bible preaching. They're, they're out here, folks. But people are not looking for it. That was the problem they had. They were not looking for what God, God said, I'll give you more glory. God told them, I'm going to do things ahead of you 
greater than anything I did behind you. And honey, he parted the Red Sea. My, you talking? Uh, you talking about the mighty power of God? Moses said, "I want you to go among us, not send an angel. I want you to go among us and go with us." Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the Word of God again. What a blessing it is to hold a Bible in our hand that we know is the very perfect, inspired, infallible, uh, Lord, inerrant, all the preserved. We've got all the words, Lord. And Lord, it's where our confidence is. I pray, Father, you'd bless the service to come. Give us a good day today. Be with our people that are sick and out. And Lord, we sure love you. Look forward, Lord, to being home one day just like today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, going to the sun, uh, prayer rooms.